Hello, everyone. My name is Laurian Collins, and I'm coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. I am a faculty member at UNC Charlotte, and I teach courses in human geography, development, spatial analysis, and hazards and disasters. Also a fun little note, I actually taught AP Human Geography for several years, about 10 years ago, and I absolutely loved teaching the course. So glad to be here with you. So in this video, we'll actually focus on Unit 7, which is Industrial and Economic Development Patterns and Processes. But more specifically, we will talk about uh, the paradigm shift in how we actually classify levels of development. So to start off, just a brief outline of what we'll go through uh, in this video. At first, we will simply define development. We'll talk briefly about uneven development. We'll talk about the indicators that we use for measurement. We'll talk about different labels of measurement terminology, and then we'll finish up with millennium development goals and sustainable development goals. So to begin with, let's simply define development. So as you can see, here's a simple definition. It's a process of improving the conditions of people through diffusion of knowledge and technology. The important thing to keep in mind here is that it's a process. It's a continuum, right? There are different levels of development from different regions of the world and uh, in different countries of the world. So as more knowledge gets constructed and technologies advance, the conditions for people get better people end up having a better, decent standard of living, have a longer and healthier lifestyle, have more access to knowledge and technologies. People are generally uh, familiar with these terms. So let's start here with the terms developed and developing. So when you think about developed countries, which countries come to mind? Is it countries like the United States, Japan, the United Kingdom, France? Why do those specific countries come to your mind? Think about that for a moment. All right, another question. When you think of developing countries, which countries come to mind here? Are they countries like Haiti, Laos, Chad, Malawi? Again, why do you think that those specific countries come to your mind? Is it what they have or don't have in those countries? Is it that the people are rich or poor? Are they more or less educated? What is it that comes to mind? Why is it that you think of those specific countries when you think of the words developing or developed country? I wanna go back to the definition just one more time. Process of improving the conditions of people through the fusion of knowledge and technology. What are those conditions that improve people's lives? There are actually three basic dimensions of human development. Health, wealth, and education. These things are gonna vary from every country to you know, country to country, from region to region, and sometimes within countries, like small particular regions within a country, you have pockets of higher development versus lesser development. So these conditions are going to fluctuate all across the world. Okay, so if we look at, say, for instance, health, the first condition, right, what's the life expectancy of the people in a given area? What about disease, right? Is there lack of disease or is there a lot of disease, access to doctors? Those can be uh, examples of how uh, the condition of health really uh, starts to tailor the level of development. If we move on to the second dimension, wealth, we can think of things, of course, like income, right, income level of individual citizens, but we can also think about maybe the GDP, the gross domestic product of the entire country, right, how much, country, how much money the country is making in a given year. We can also think about trading capacity. If we move on to the third one, education, oftentimes we think about how, how much are people educated? How many years of education, formal education, is standard in any given uh, country. We can also look at things like literacy rate. So those are the three conditions that we typically look at um, when, we, when we talk about levels of development. It's also important to, to keep in mind that culturally relative process. Development involves culture, right? And it's relative 
based on where in the world we're talking about. So the definition of needs is going to vary from society to society. One group of people might have one need at the height of their value, whereas a different society is going to have different needs sort of uh, at the top of that realm. So the value of development really varies from society to society. Keep in mind that this sort of rush of progress is not as valued everywhere as it is sometimes here in the West. Also, the process of development is really in the eye of the beholder. It means different things to different people. So development, very much so a culturally relative process. Now, let's talk for a moment about uneven development. So here's a definition of the term uh, uneven development. The increasing gap in economic conditions between developed and developing regions that results from globalization of the economy. So again, we're focused on those conditions, right, that we just talked about. And largely, those conditions are thought about economically, right? Inequalities exist among countries, but also within countries. Think about scale, right? Huge concept in geography. Well, we have different inequalities that exist regionally and at local scales, not just internationally from country to country. And we can observe these inequalities by just noticing the changing landscapes, all the different patterns, drive from one part of town to another. And we see things change right before our very eyes. The types of stores that are there, the sizes of houses, just to name a couple, right? So we see evidence of these inequalities just by observing the landscape around us. So uneven development tells us that there are basically rounds of investment versus disinvestment in different places. This is really evident uh, with say the deindustrialization of the Midwest, right? Um, and also patterns that we see all over of gentrification. So really these, these rounds of uh, investment versus disinvestment. Investors are largely interested in seeking out places that don't have as much investment in order to try and develop bigger profits, right? So then that takes us to think about the accessibility of development. How accessible are places to development? Well, we look at things like the infrastructure, their transportation networks, right? What is the road system like? Is there an interstate system or highway system? Uh, is there an airport? Does it have paved runways? right? Um, power grids, right? Electricity, running water. We look at all of those sort of infrastructural type of things when we begin to look at how accessible or unaccessible an area is to future development. So a lot of our economic theories really suggest that we're moving towards this idea of equilibrium, uh, that over time, places are going to become more and more similar. But if we take a look at the past three, 400 years all around the world, we don't necessarily see that equilibrium as being true. Rather, we see sort of wealthy areas remaining in sort of the wealthy spectrum and poorer areas remaining more in the poorer perspective or poorer spectrum, right? So not necessarily all that true based on some economic theories. So how then do we measure development, right? What are those conditions that we use that are going to suggest whether a country is developed or it's still developing? So what are those things that vary among countries, right? We're gonna talk about indicators for a moment of measurement, right? These are those varying conditions, right? These are the indicators that we use to measure development. I'm gonna divide these into three broad categories, economic, social, and demographic. You may have been uh, taught or learned about uh, the United Nations HDI or Human Development Index. That is simply one way that is used to measure levels of development from country to country across the planet. But it's, keep in mind, only one way, and that's the United Nations way. 
However, I am going to use their three broad categories, economic, social, and demographic, to talk briefly about different indicators of measurement, okay? So first off, let's look at a couple of economic indicators. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, so I'm just giving you some ideas, sort of food for thought here. So some economic indicators uh, of measurement would be GNI per capita, gross national income per capita. What's the average income that a citizen is going to make in any given year? Uh, another one is composition by economic sector, right? Um, are jobs largely in the primary economic sector, meaning largely agricultural or forestry, right? Uh, or are they more in the secondary economic sector, which is industry? Or are they more in the tertiary sector, which is services? Another example of economic indicators to, uh, to measure levels of development are consumer goods per capita. We can look at things like um, internet access. How many people have access to internet? How many cars do the average person or the average family have? Um, how many cell phones, right? Those, that's what I mean by consumer goods. So those are all economic examples of indicators. All right, moving on to the middle one, social. Social indicators, again, not an exhaustive list, but some things to think about. The literacy rate, right? How many people, and usually this is based on age 15 and above, so you know, you're not measuring little ones who are four or five who most likely cannot read, right? Um, but the literacy rate, how many people in the society actually can read and write? Another way of measuring social indicators is the years of education. Some countries have 10, 11, 12 uh, compulsory years of education, meaning you're required to go to school that many years in that country, versus some, it's way lower, such as two or three years. And that also varies depending on your gender in some countries. Here's a good one, a social indicator, gross national happiness. There are increasingly more and more countries, this began in Nepal, um, but they measure the happiness of their citizens rather than just how wealthy they are, right? Or how literate they are. So this is yet another example of an indicator of measurement under the social category. Gender related development index, I kind of mentioned that with years of education, but it doesn't have to be just years of education. This can be, you know, um, types of jobs for the different genders, types of, or how many people are in uh, government, right? Legislatures, um, male versus female. So these are some examples of social indicators. And then finally, let's look at some demographic indicators of measurement. Life expectancy, how long is one expected to live, right? We want this to be as high as possible. That insinuates that we are a healthy society. Infant mortality rate is another demographic indicator of measurement. This one we want to be very low, right? Infant mortality rate. Natural increase rate. All of these are just examples of demographic indicators of measurement. And all of these that I've just mentioned, certainly not an exhaustive list, okay? So keep that in mind. Those are just some samples. So the average of all these indicators we've just looked at, right, through time have given way to different labels of places that have different levels of development. So labels meaning terminology, right, of how we classify places based on its level of development. So there's been a recent paradigm shift uh, in how we classify places of varying development. Um, sort of an evolution of thinking about geographic distribution of poverty versus prosperity. Now, here's something to keep in mind as well. Nobody actually ever agrees on the definition of all of these terms in the first place, right? Depends on who you ask. But these are some of the major terms that you'll see thrown about. Uh, I would argue these are some of the more popular ones, popular labels. So let's take a look at some of these and how their use has changed over time. So the first few that I want you to look at are the vertical uh, row on the top. So first world, second world, third world, 
right? You've heard these terms before, I'm sure. These are really some of the oldest labels of development out there. And they uh, exist from the 1950s, from a demographer back in the 1950s. And it's the idea that there are three worlds that exist on one planet. And it goes all the way back to the Cold War, War era, where first world countries were really considered to be the countries of Western capitalism. So the United States, Western European countries, and then their allies. And then second world would be the um, Soviet socialism countries, right? So the communist bloc. So the USSR, China, Cuba, and their allies. And then you have this third world, which is pretty much the other, right? Everybody else, not necessarily in either block. And the third world has always had really blurry lines. Um, many of these countries were impoverished. So third world kind of became this term that we associate for the poorer part of the world. A lot of these were either colonies or former colonies of um, you know, the, the colonizing countries in the first and second world. So if we look at the first, second, and third world labels, is it really a clear category of analysis or is it just sort of conveniently vague labels? They're now really out of date. And in fact, they can be considered insulting to many people, but confusing at, at very least, right? What exactly is first or second or third world? And they're confusing because, well, for starters, the Soviet Union doesn't even exist anymore, right? So there goes your sort of basis of second world. Um, and then if you think of an affluent country, say, somebody like Saudi Arabia, right? Well, they're not Western, they're not communist, but yet they're classified as third world. Well, that doesn't fit, right? And furthermore, who's to say who is first world, right? Um, you know, first world being the, the, the Western capital countries, but if you take even the United States has large pockets of poverty and social inequality within them. So, these are very dated terms. Moving on to the second row, core, semi-periphery, and periphery. So these terms are utilized uh, from the world systems theory. You might have heard of this before, Wallerstein's theory that dates back to the 1970s, which really incorporates not only space, but time and power relationships. Okay. Um, it's this three sort of tiered hierarchy or structure that's based on interconnections, global interconnections from one country to another. So the core countries are really countries or regions that have high levels of economic prosperity. They're generally dominant in the world economy. They have higher levels of education for their people. They use higher technologies, which combined really generally result into higher wages. These core countries though often exploit the periphery countries for things such as labor and raw materials. Now I want you to move all the way over to the third column, the periphery. I'll come back to semi-periphery in just a moment. But the periphery, these are the poorer regions of the world or the poorer countries of the world. They are more dependent on the core countries and they are often the exploited, right? Um, so that's the other end of the spectrum. But then you come back to the middle and you have the semi-periphery countries or regions of the world. Well, these are areas that share characteristics of both, right? They exert more power than the periphery countries, but yet they still rely heavily on the core countries. These terms, the core, the periphery, and the semi-periphery, are often used a lot by geographers, not only because they do incorporate space and time, but the power relationships as well. All right, moving down the graphic here, let's go to the, the next row, developed versus developing, okay? You might have heard the terms MDCs or LDCs, right? MDC suggesting more developed countries, LDCs suggesting lesser developed countries. These terms, are very convenient. Generally, everyone understands what you mean if you say a developed country or a developing country. Notice this is how I started off this video using these terms to sort of introduce the topic of development and the labels that we use. 
the United Nations uses these terms. NPR up until very recently has used these terms. The AP, the Associated Press uses these terms. So these are, like I said, generally understood by everyone. Um, but lately they've been more considered as negative terms because some suggest that they assume a hierarchy between countries, right? It replaces sort of the, the colonizer versus the colonized countries, okay? So sort of dividing between control and exploitation. Uh, these terms also can suggest that, or really paint a picture of Western society being more idealistic, but we know that not to be necessarily true. There's many social issues that clearly exist in these Western more quote developed countries, right? Um, one group uh, or uh, global organization that has discontinued the terms uh, is the World Bank. So these terms are sort of on their way out as well. Now we can also take a look at the next group, Global North and Global South, right? These are just geographic labeling that really divides the world into almost the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, but really around that 30 degrees North parallel we call the Brandt line. Um, but I just wanted to give mention to these terms. These are very, very broad, very broad. And obviously a lot of issues with these terms simply because you take places like Haiti, one of the you know, poorer nations of the world, but yet it's in the North. And then you take, for example, Australia, New Zealand, you know, Western countries, if you will, but they are in the global South. So just exposing you to these terms, they are used to, to sort of label levels of development, but just using geography to do so. And then the last row, we have HICs, MICs, and LICs, right? These are basically uh, higher income countries, middle income countries, in lower income countries. So this is based largely on uh, how, much how much industry exists in the countries. But the cool thing here is that these terms actually use data, right? To back up the label, right? High levels of industry, middle levels of industry and lower levels of industry. Uh, the World Health Organization actually uses these terms, okay? So again, these are just sort of a lot of different terms that you'll see used about um, to describe different levels of development. But I want you now, instead of to look at the horizontal rows, look at the vertical rows. So the vertical uh, row to the left, those are all sort of similar terms, first world, core, developed, global north, HICs, right? You may even hear advanced market countries, right? So those terms or labels are all similar in their definitions. And then the middle column, second world, semi-periphery, developing, global south, and MICs, those are all sort of synonymous in their labeling of levels of development. And then finally, third world, periphery, or LICs. So these are the terms that are out there, but let's take it a step further. What if we just got rid of the labeling altogether and just use the name of the country in whatever statistic it is we're trying to measure different levels of? So for example, infant mortality rate. What if we look just at the infant mortality rate, say of Senegal versus Sweden, and then we compare different countries based on the same system of measurement, the same label, if you will. So there's this push to sort of really begin to use actual data to classify development. So the United Nations along those lines decided to develop what we know as MDGs and SDGs. So MDGs, as you can see here, are the Millennium Development Goals, right? And again, all coming out of the desire for sort of more analytically useful data to describe different areas of development. So the MDGs were created by the United Nations in the year 2000, it's sort of a roadmap for fighting global poverty, okay? It's kind of important to understand that these development goals were really sort of meant for developing countries, right? So you sort of have the helpers versus the ones who needed help, okay? Um, 
But nonetheless, the United Nations came up with eight goals to try to achieve in a 15 year span. So from 2000 to 2015. These were then superseded by the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals. These, as you can see, were created in 2015 by the United Nations, but conversely, they were sort of a roadmap for universal sustainable development. Okay, so a little bit different, not just fighting global poverty, but rather trying to sustain development all over the world, universal, not just for the developing or the poorer countries of the world. These goals were meant for everyone, every country, the entire global community. And there are also 17 of these goals. So they more than doubled, right? So these began in 2015, and the idea is to achieve these goals by the year 2030. These goals, as you'll see in a moment, are much broader, much deeper, and far more ambitious in scope, a tall order to, to achieve these. So let's take a moment and look at the Millennium Development Goals. There are eight of them. The first one is eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. Number two, achieving universal primary education. Number three, promoting gender equality and empowering women. Number four, reducing child mortality. Number five, improving maternal health, the health of the mothers. Number six, combating uh, AIDS and HIV, along with malaria and other diseases. Number seven, ensuring environmental sustainability. So moving into the environmental realm. And then finally, the eighth one, uh, is the goal to develop a global partnership for development. So these are the eight MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. So this is sort of the consensus of those key conditions that need to change in order to achieve economic development. There's been some measurable progress with those in the, in the 15 years from 2000 to 2015. Uh, primarily with um, reducing undernourishment and making some headway in um, gender equality issues, largely with the number of women in, in legislatures increasing. But these gave way to the SDGs. So here are the sustainable development goals. And you can see here, there are 17 of them, right? These are much more expansive, more utopian, if you will, in achievement. That's why we set goals, right? These are much more difficult to attain because number one, we're talking about every country in the world obtaining all these 17 goals and meeting these goals. But again, that's why we set goals, right? It gives us something to work towards. So aims to be relevant for all countries, right? So if you look here, number one, promote uh, uh, no poverty. Number two, zero hunger. If you remember, those were lumped into one in the MDGs. Number three, good health and well-being. Four, quality education. Five, gender equality. Now here's a new one. Six, clean water and sanitation. Seven, another new one, affordable and clean energy. Eight, decent work and economic growth. Nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Number 10, just reduced inequalities, very broad, reduced inequalities. 11, sustainable cities and communities. Number 12, responsible consumption and production. Number 13, climate action. Number 14, life below water, looking at the oceans. 15, life on land, the terrestrial landscape and those ecosystems. 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And then finally, 17, the partnerships for the goals, right? Developing those partnerships again, okay? So you can see that these 17 goals, much more expansive, um, promoting prosperity while protecting the environment, but also there's a much larger focus on improving equity for all groups of people across the planet. All of these goals have targets. In other words, measurable targets that, that can be achieved. But it's kind of interesting that 
not all of these targets are being currently measured by the United Nations. So these are just ways that we can measure development. I encourage you to go to the United Nations website and explore more about these sustainable development goals and how we can measure these in different regions of the world in different countries across the world. So I'll leave you with this. The SDGs are arguably more developed than the MDGs. High, tall order to achieve. But again, that's why we make goals, to try to better the societies of every human across the planet. This uh, unit, right, economic development, is very near and dear to my heart. And I want you to always remember that we can always do something to help improve the lives of others across the planet. Thank you so much for joining me today. Take care.